Hello, I'm Rich Robertson, President and CEO of the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, commonly known as LCEF. The Lutheran Church Missouri Synod has worked tirelessly to make this film, The First Rosa, possible, and LCEF is pleased to be a sponsor of its production. Rosa Young was truly an amazing Christian, a pioneer in Lutheran education mission work. The time has come to celebrate her accomplishments. Rosa was determined to nurture future church leaders and see the Lutheran faith blossom. LCEF shares the same drive and passion. Our goal each day is to identify opportunities to share financial resources and professional services in order to empower ministries in their kingdom work. We want more people to hear and believe, be baptized and grow in the word. We bring together people and ministries intent on the precious gift of grace and eternal life. We are honored to lift up Rose's work and pray she serves as an inspiration to you and your family and future church workers. Thank you and God's richest blessings. The heroic story of Rosa Parks refusing to move to the back of the bus and the civil rights struggle it ignited is known to every American school child. Congratulations. There was another Rosa, just as heroic who is little known. Her struggle led to a massive theological shift in Southern Alabama. We call her the first Rosa. Oratio, meditatio, tentatio. Prayer, meditation, trial, make a theologian. Martin Luther said that. It defined his life. And if you're considering the preaching or teaching ministry, it will define your life. It certainly defined the life of the woman we call the first Rosa, Rosa Young. Hers is a story that can't help but inspire you as it has me. The Civil War had raged for four bloody years, just three decades before Rosa Young was born. General Robert E. Lee's surrender on April 9, 1865, finally rescued blacks from the slavery that had torn our nation apart. Six days later, it would cost President Lincoln his life. But it brought new life to Rosa's forebears. That new life was sadly filled with extreme poverty and Rosebud, Alabama, where Rosa was born. She reminisced about it many years later, the day she received an honorary doctorate. Our houses were no more than shacks. Women usually wore one-piece dresses, often tied around the waist by a string. Men and boys wore their trousers, rolled halfway up to their knee, and held them up with homemade suspenders. Many went barefoot. Dinner consists of a piece of bread, maybe a sweet potato and collard greens or peas cooked with okra. Far worse than this poverty was the poverty of religion. Many of our colored children had never heard of Jesus. Just think of it. They had never heard the story of Jesus suffering and dying for the sins of the world. No one had been sufficiently interested in the welfare of their souls to tell them. Right here in the land of Bibles, thousands of colored children were growing up without hope, without God. Rosa was an exception. Her father, Grant Young, 
was an African Methodist pastor, and her mother, Nancy, taught her the Lord's Prayer and her first recitation. The following is part of it, all that I remember. A little child who loves to pray and read the Bible too shall rise above the skies someday and sing an angel adieu. <laughs> the first hymn that I remember that I could sing, I learned from my older sister. I remember the first verse goes as follows. Can it be right that I should go on in this dark, uncertain way? Yet I believe and do not know whether my sins are washed away. That hymn was misleading. The poet says that he believes, and still he says that he does not know whether his sins are washed away. He should have known that. For the Bible tells us that all of our sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus, the Son of God. So you can see how my poor soul was in darkness, groping blindly for salvation. Seems strange to us that Rosa would say that, especially when her father was a pastor. But black pastors in those days were not seminary trained. They were self-taught. Sad. Sad. We were the blind and leaders of the blind. We did not know the Bible, neither did the preachers know it. We did not know what we must do to be saved, neither did the preachers. They were preaching false doctrine, and we did not know it. We did not know that Jesus has done all that is necessary for our salvation, and the preachers didn't know it. We wanted to go to heaven, but we didn't know the way. They held divine services on an average of once a month. Both men and women would go down on their knees and pray as loud as they could holler, oftentimes using all kinds of profane language and blasphemy. They would call on God as if he were asleep or dead. The preachers would read a text and then branch off preaching on all kinds of man-made doctrine and telling the people that those things were in the Bible. Many a time, the name of Jesus was not mentioned during a whole sermon. The preachers would hoop and holler and pat and stamp and snort and blow until the people were in an uproar, shouting and hollering too. Rosa's father may not have been that kind of preacher. Even though doctrinally, he appears to have shared the shortcomings of his peers. Theology aside, he believed strongly in education and for a short time had his brother Mitchell, a student of Tuskegee Institute, instruct Rosa. Rosa possessed an unusually brilliant mind. She would soon become the family teacher, teaching all the younger children at home. Above all, she recalls how her uncle Mitchell's brief schooling left her with her one and only book, a Bible, and a passion to read it. I remember well how I would sit for hours all by myself and my Bible. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is in sight. Besides reading the Bible, I prayed often. I even vowed to the Lord that if he would give me a higher education, I would serve him with it. This I prayed almost incessantly until one day. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, 
Just give me Jesus When I am Mighty pretty singing, Rosa. Mr. Harper, thank you, sir. <laughs> Say, where's your brothers and sisters? I thought they'd be picking with you. They're coming. I got an early start. I know. You set an example for them. You teach them how to work. Yes, sir. You teach them in their books at night, too, don't you? Yes, sir. I've been meaning to tell you, your folks ought to educate you. Oh, <laughs> they sure ought to give you an education. Pass that on to them, huh? You pass that on to them. Yes, sir. When I come to die, oh, when I... She went home and told her parents what Mr. Harper had said. Soon after this, it became the common talk among the various relatives that she should be sent to high school. Somehow the family scraped up enough money to send Rosa to high school for the better part of a school year. She would spend the next two summers picking cotton, and the summers after that, teaching to pay her tuition for the next year. In short order, she rose to the top of her class and upon graduation, gave the valedictorian oration entitled, Serve the People. It left the audience in tears. One of the paragraphs was particularly moving. He that is greatest among you shall be your servant, is the language of the great teacher. To serve is regarded as a divine privilege as well as a duty of every right-minded man. Do something worthy for mankind is the cry of a civilized world. Give light to those who are in darkness. Sustain the weak and the faltering. Befriend the poor and the needy. Rosa taught some of Alabama's most needy black children for the next three years and lived without complaint in whatever quarters were available to her. She felt frustrated over many things, especially over the fact that the school terms lasted only three or four months a year. During the long vacation of eight or nine months, the children would invariably forget most of what they had learned. Then in the spring of 1912, as her students were playing in the schoolyard, The thought came to my mind to build a large school in the country which would enable the children to have a longer school term, to run the school on a cheap basis that would enable the poorest boys and girls to obtain a good education, to establish a school to give the youth a real, true, threefold education of head, hand, and heart. When I returned to my boarding place that evening, sitting by the fire, I talked to God in my heart for a long time about the proposition of the school. When I retired, I prayed myself to sleep over it. If oratio, prayer, makes a theologian as Luther said, Rosa's prayer life was beginning to make one of her. She was learning that if God chooses to open doors for you, he can do so in amazingly rapid succession. First, Rosa's father shared her vision of the new kind of school with a white friend. He showed great enthusiasm for the idea and promised his support if she would build it in Rosebud. Accepting his suggestion, Rosa decided to draft a letter explaining her plan in a way that might prompt other white people to lend their support. Again, arming herself with prayer, she spent five days drafting that letter. She later said, I prayed, wrote, and rewrote. There was no one to guide, instruct, or teach me just what to say, except the Lord. Finally, with more prayer, she asked her father to deliver her letter to Mr. J. Lee Bonner, the leading white man in Rosebud. Mr. Bonner received your letter kindly. He must have read it four or five times. He said, tell Rosa for me that if she can do whatever she can to help her race, 
she can have not only my approval, but also my money. <laughs> really? Really, he said that? That's what he said. <sighs> if God moved quickly to that point, he now moved even faster. In three short months, on the first Monday of October, 1912, Rosa would open her dream school. She called it the Rosebud Literary and Industrial School. It was located on five acres that Rosa's mother and two of her mother's brothers had inherited. The school began with only seven pupils, but by the end of the first year, enrollment reached 155. In the second year, the enrollment climbed to 215. Then came the third year, and Rosa had to learn the meaning of tentatio, the Latin term Luther used for trial. That trial came in the guise of cotton-destroying Mexican boll weevils that descended on Alabama like a firestorm. They'd come to Texas first. One Texan made a song about them. Funny, but not funny to those whose cotton crops were wiped out because of them. Oh, the boll weevil am a little black bug come from Mexico, they say. Come all the way to Texas. Looking for a place to stay, just looking for a home, just looking for a home. The first time I seen the boll weevil, it was a sitting on the square. The next time I seen the boll weevil, he had a, all his family there, just looking for a home, just looking for a home. The boll weevil said to the farmer, oh, you better leave me alone. Done eat all your cotton. Now I'm gonna start on your corn. I'll have a home. I'll have a home. The merchant got half the cotton. The bow weevil got the rest. He didn't leave the farmer's wife but a one old cotton dress, and it's full of holes. It's full of holes. The farmer said to the merchant, we in an awful fix. The boll weevil laid all the cotton up and left us only sticks. We got no home. We got no home. The boll weevil not only left farmers with no home, it nearly left Rosa Young with no school. For her, it was tentatio, a trial of the first magnitude. The parents of her school children were tenant farmers whose work had been harvesting cotton. And when that crop was destroyed, their livelihood was destroyed. No longer could they pay even the token amount Rosa asked for tuition. With tuition gone, there was no money to pay teachers. And one by one, they left. Rosa desperately drafted letters, reaching out to potential donor after potential donor. But to no avail. I prayed and prayed. Then I decided I would write one more letter, and if no relief came, then I would close the school. Now, that letter was to Dr. Booker T. Washington, our great leader. I wrote Dr. Washington that I felt he had all that he could look after in the operations of Tuskegee Institute. All, therefore, that I asked of him was to give me the name of some individual or association up north that he thought would help me keep my school alive. The next day, I mailed my letter and then prayed and waited for an answer. At last, a letter came from Tuskegee Institute, signed by Booker T. Washington himself. He advised me to write to the Board of Colored Missions at the Lutheran Church. He said that they were doing more for the colored race than any denomination that he knew of. He gave me the address of Reverend Christopher F. Drews, who was the chairman of the Board of Colored Missions. Dr. Washington knew a lot about many things. And he knew that the Lutheran Church had already opened black schools and churches in Arkansas, Louisiana, Virginia, and North Carolina. By this time, the Synodical Conference of the Lutheran Church had been doing mission work among blacks for nearly 40 years, but not without personal cost to some of its white missionaries at the hands of other whites. By other whites, I mean the Ku Klux Klan, the Knights of White Camellia, and other lawless groups that had been roaming the South unhindered ever since the end of the Civil War. 
People they called carpetbaggers and scallywags were hounded, tortured, and even executed. The man one black historian called the greatest white Lutheran missionary of them all, Reverend Niels J. Bakke, had to be saved from the Klan's fury in Mississippi. Discovering the time he would be boarding a local train, they were waiting for him on the one country road that led to the railroad station. His sin? Visiting with colored people in their homes and associating with them on an equal level. Taking back roads, he rushed to beat the train to a station eight miles down the track. Bakke's savior was a black Baptist, a deacon in his church. It was touch and go, but he arrived just in time for Reverend Bakke to climb aboard. Bakke would later joke that he may have been the only Lutheran pastor who owed his personal salvation to a Baptist deacon. Missionary Bakke was destined to play a major role in Rosa Young's life. Although the South had lost the Civil War, it soon reintroduced the old slave codes under the title Black Codes. Many, white and black, who resisted the codes as Reverend Bakke did, mysteriously disappeared never to be heard from again. Blacks were never to approach the front door of a white family, regardless of who they were. And whites were never to approach the back door of a black family. When white Lutheran missionaries began house visitation among black members, or home visitation for outreach to blacks who were not yet members, the Klan became livid. And if the missionary were discovered sitting down and dining with black families and on an equal social level, it was the last straw. Rosa Young was experiencing tentatio, trial, because of the lack of funding for her school brought on by the bull weevil. But the Lutheran missionaries experienced tentatio because of the most basic ways they were trying to serve the black community. Yet they continued on, bravely. And the Synodical Conference continued to bravely send them out while praying unceasingly for their safety. That pattern was to be repeated again when Rosa Young's letter arrived in the hands of Reverend Christopher Drews, chairman of the Board for Colored Missions. Immediately, Reverend Drews set the wheels in motion to bravely send a missionary to Rosebud and investigate Rosa's plea for help. The one he chose was his very best, Reverend Niels Bakke, now in his 60s and showing his age. I sent my father to pick him up at the railroad station. Pastor Bakke. be Rosa Young's father. She told me you'd be meeting me. Yes, I was, was expecting someone. Someone who isn't 63? <laughs> and uh, not so battle-scarred? You've been in the war. God's war. The veteran of many a spiritual battle for the Savior was coming to preach the pure gospel to the colored people in the Black Belt of Alabama to lead us from darkness into light. I still remember how Pastor Bakke asked me to lead in singing when I introduced him to the local school board the next night right here in our Rosebud schoolhouse. I sang one of those plantation hymns. Goes like this. Heavy load, heavy load, I'm gonna lay down my heavy load. <laughs> 
Some years after that, Pastor Baki teased me saying, Rosa, you said you were going to lay down your heavy load and you laid it right on me. <laughs> it's true, I did, but he bore it so beautifully. Our school board loved him and signed a resolution to turn over the school to the Lutheran Church. On Sunday morning, he preached to us, and oh, what a sermon. That was the first time we poor colored people heard the pure preaching of the gospel. And when Pastor Baki finished, he had a convinced audience. At the meeting of the Board for Colored Missions, when he reported on his visit to Rosebud, he had a convinced audience there as well. They voted to send him back to us as the first Lutheran missionary to Alabama. A month later, Pastor Baki was here teaching us new hymns we had never heard, words and melodies that made a deep impression on my heart. All right, let's try it again. Now, some of you were swaying to the music last time. That's fine. If King David could dance before the Lord, you can sway. Here we go. Rosa, I could hear your voice peeking out above the others. Let's hear you sing the last verse solo. Do you mind? When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, clothed in his righteousness alone, redeemed to stand before his Wonderful, wonderful. At my request, the mission board also sent a colored missionary from St. Louis to teach the advanced pupils at our Rosebud School. I taught the smaller children, and Pastor Baki taught religion, not only to the children, but to me as well. When I sat at the feet of Pastor Baki during those religious periods, I heard so many wonderful things about the old, old story of Jesus and his great love for sinners. But the most powerful message, the loudest message that you can hear from our God is in the person of Jesus Christ. I received rich treasures. I found a pearl of great price, which I would not cast away if God is with me for 10,000 worlds. On Palm Sunday, I was the first to be confirmed, and a host of others followed. Fifty-eight were baptized, and seventy were confirmed that day. Pastor Baki said it was the largest confirmation class he had ever done at any one time. On Easter Sunday, he baptized many more people and organized the Christ Congregation, our mother church in Alabama. After four years of God blessing our work amazingly, so amazingly, Reverend Baki would take his leave of us. His decline in health made it unwise to stay. On October 3rd, 1920, he said his final farewells. I will never forget his parting words to me. Rosa, I leave you in the hands of God who created you. I leave you in the hands of God who redeemed you. I leave you in the hands of God who sanctified you. Now, if you fall away from the church and are lost, 
You cannot say on Judgment Day, Lord, I am lost because Pastor Bucky, whom you sent to Alabama, did not tell me the truth. For I have told you the truth, the whole truth. Goodbye, Rosa. I never saw him again. He was scarcely gone a year from us when the Lord called him to his reward. God had used missionary Baki to make Rosa a theologian. Before he arrived, she had been well-schooled in oratio, prayer, and its wonderful power. He arrived when she was being battered by tentatio, trial, and in four years working with her, he taught her meditatio, meditation. Meditation of the highest kind. Meditation on the gospel. The good news of the incredible depth of God's love for us in Jesus Christ. The Lord used his new theologian, Rosa, and her co-workers to grow the Lutheran Church in Alabama in ways so spectacular that it set records in modern American mission history. We added many new mission sites while Reverend Bakke was still with us. Churches at Oak Hill and Possum Bend, a Sunday school at Vredenburg, Buena Vista, and Tenela, a day school at Midway, missions at Ingomar, Nylon, and Tate's Place. Much of the time, people sought us out and asked us to begin work in their community because they had heard about our Lutheran preaching and our unusual school at Rosebud. After missionary Baki left us, the Lord continued to use us to keep the gospel spread into ever-increasing areas. This church is one of them. Others we located at Joffrey, Hamburg, Birmingham, Mobile, Montrose, Camden, Atmore, Selma, Catherine, Rock West, Holy Ark, Long Mile, Ackerville, Lamson, Pine Hill, Arlington, Maplesville, Bashai, Vinland, Maysville, even as far as Pensacola, Florida. By 1946, we had 35 colored Lutheran congregations in the Alabama field. We had 30 schools, 26 female teachers, three male teachers, and five pastors. We would have had still more had it not been for the new trials that bedeviled our work, attacks on my co-workers and attacks on me. I felt the sting of those attacks, felt them deeply. It was this new tentatio, this new trial, that stung and tore at her heart. The very day I joined the Evangelical Lutheran Church, willing to work for Jesus, is a day in which the devil turned the people against me. The host of friends I had in the sectarian churches deserted me. Preachers stood up and proclaimed from their pulpit, Rosa Young, is a devil. Others proclaimed, Rosa Young is a, a Jezebel, an antichrist, a false prophet. Rosa Young is a white man woman. She is not fit to lead you. She is not fit to teach your children. Whenever I was able to get up a class for confirmation or baptism, the enemies would unite their powers and break it up. They would go around telling the people that the Lutheran Church was going to put them all back under slavery if they sent their children to our schools. They said that the Lutheran Church was going to cut off the children's ears, brand an L on them with a red-hot iron, as a mark that they are now Lutheran. The dreamers reported that they had been to hell and seen Rosa Young yoked down with all the people that had followed her into the Lutheran Church. Numbers of poor, ignorant people believed this. Many turned against me. 
I could not get a kind word or favor from my old friends. Jesus promised his disciples to replace lost family and friends with new ones. And he did so with Rosa. Long after Jesus took her to himself, Rosa Young's new friends still gather at Rosebud to remember her. In 1946, God gave Rosa a fresh challenge. She referred to it as a thunderbolt out of a clear sky. It was a call to go to the Alabama Lutheran Academy at Selma and join the faculty. The academy had been started by a black pastor, Reverend O.A. Lynn, who had served at three mission sites begun while Reverend Niels Bakke was still in the field. Being a profound scholar, Reverend Lynn had a great passion for training young men and women of his race to be pastors and teachers. Now the academy needed on its faculty someone to inspire those students. And everyone knew that none fit the bill better than the mother of Alabama black Lutheranism, Rosa Young. For Rosa, it was decision time, which meant time once again for oratio, prayer. I went to my heavenly father and asked him what to do. I prayed almost constantly. I fell asleep praying, and when I awoke, my first thought was a prayer. I went to the church, and down on my knees before the altar, I poured out my heart to God. I had no rest, no peace, until the Lord made it clear to me that He wanted me at Selma. Rosa would later say, If it's the Lord's will, I shall be happy to spend the rest of my days here helping the boys and girls who are preparing for the holy ministry and for teaching in our Christian day schools. That's exactly how she spent her days, until the candle of life burned low, flickered, and nearly went out, forcing her retirement in 1961. The boys and girls she inspired at Selma cannot forget her. Some now in their 80s and 90s. She was really interested in missionaries, missionary, mission work, getting young men from for the ministry and young ladies for teaching. But I never lost the uh, dream, nor forgot the commitment that I made in 1927 uh, to Rosa J. Young to become a Lutheran minister. Then she'd come to me and, what do you plan? I said, I want to be a teacher. The second brother, Oscar, was smart enough to say, I want to be a preacher. And she said, oh my goodness, blessing, there's my child. So the two of us was somewhat favorite, maybe. Dr. Rosa Young's presence on Concordia's campus was just uh, a blessing in itself. I was there for nine years, from sixth grade to second year college. And uh, as a little boy coming at 11 years of age, she was someone whom we just kind of revered, I guess, as such. Of course, you know, she was one of those who was always a recruiter for the church. I mean, she would, she would tell the young ladies, you are going to be a teacher. There was no question about it. If she spoke those words over you, somehow the Holy Spirit and the Lord just worked it out so that you became one of those individuals. The guys, she would all do a little extra with them. She would place her hands upon their heads and say, you are going to be a preacher. And of course, there were those who didn't want to be a preacher who would duck and run to keep Dr. Young from placing her hands upon their heads and giving that blessing or that ultimatum that you are going to be a preacher so that it would not come true because just as sure as she placed her hands upon your head, it was almost a given that you were going to be one of those preachers of hers. What I found special about Rosa J. Young was a humble spirit, a modest lady, a lady who knew what she wanted and was not going to take no for an answer. Her tenacity, I think I would say, is described. Her. She was a tenacity person. She had tenacity on her side, and evidently the Lord was on her side too. We just love her. Just truly loved Dr. Young. Oratio, meditatio, tentatio, had made of Rosa a true theologian. Concordia Theological Seminary 
recognized that by bestowing on her an honorary doctorate in 1961. Ten years later, the Lord bestowed on her an even greater honor, presenting her with the crown of life in his heavenly kingdom. Her body is buried in front of Christ Lutheran Church in Rosebud, the mother church of Alabama Lutheranism. Rosie Young's heroic story is the story of every pastor, every teacher. The outward details are certainly different, but the core of prayer, meditation, and trial is the same. If God is nudging you into service in the church, let Rose's willingness to serve him, whatever the challenges, encourage and inspire you. to die oh when i come to die oh when i come to die give me jesus give me jesus give me jesus Give me Jesus. 